Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ask the Expert session on user configuration. So you've got myself here, Richard, the Head of Service Management at Tiger, and uh, myself, Matt Ringsell, I'm the Technical Product Lead here at Tiger. Thank you. Right, so we're going to get straight into it. Um, okay, so no further ado, we'll go into the questions. So the first question that we've got today, um, with my ISO 27000 and one certification in mind, um, what models of user security are available in PRISM? And look, I think this question would probably apply to anyone who's got that security team kind of going to them, convince me it's secure, it's safe. So Matt, give us a give us a bit of an overview of how the um, PRISM security works, please. Sure, so I'm gonna take you guys through just a high level of what's available through the PRISM security. So I'm gonna start with what's available as a standard role. So we have a basic role called system administrator, which basically gives you access to everything, okay? So it'll give you access to all the windows, all of the data that's stored within PRISM, uh, with the exception of the data protection representative role, which is the GDPR role. So it leads me on to that one. So the GDPR role is just a single role which allows the GDPR administrators to access PRISM and anonymize data if somebody makes a request to the business that that data needs to be anonymized. So that role does not, doesn't allow access to anything into PRISM other than being able to anonymize data. There is a view my calls role, which allows users just to see their own calls. So between um, when they log in using their view my calls role, it will log them into my the view my activity role and it will just show them their own data and show you nothing else. There is then another special role called view my directories. Now this is a special role that when assigned to a user, it will give them access to the CDR records in their department and any department that's below them. So when we look at a hierarchy, you'll have a department. If they're in that department, they'll be able to see all those users in that department. If there are any sub-departments, they'll be able to see uh, all of the CDR records for those users as well. So there are standard roles out of the box. Every installation will have those roles available to you. Now, we'll come back to these in a bit more detail, I'm sure, throughout the presentation, but that's just to give you a high level of the standard roles. Yeah, I think I'll just pick up one comment there. I mean, one of the trends we see is a lot of people feel that system administrator is, oh, somebody's asking for access, I just need to set them up as a system administrator. And, and we know from experience that puts a lot of people off sharing their PRISM access. What we want you to take away today is you can give everyone as little or as much as you want access wise within PRISM. Um, but yeah, sorry, Matt, go on. So as, uh, along with the standard roles, obviously you can customize the level of access that's available to users within PRISM. The way it's done is it's available through multiple layers of security. So when we talk about these security layers, um, I'm going to talk to you about them as Lego bricks. So they are bricks that you can create that allow you to apply them to users to limit their access within Tiger Prism. So we start with the first building brick, which is called permissions. So the permissions are when you log into Tiger Prism, what on the screen can you see? So which tiles are available to you and within the tiles, which menu options are available? Now, all the permissions does is either shows those menu options or doesn't. What it doesn't do is it doesn't then lock down the data that's contained within those menu options. OK, so we talk about that as the permissions building blocks. On top of that, then you then need to apply what's known as enterprise groups. So the enterprise groups then allow you to limit what data a user can see. So this is talking about CDR data. So whether they can see calls made from a particular department, from a particular um, tree, from here. So we look at these departments, cost centers, and projects groups, and this allows you to say, right, this group only has access to the, the sales department or the, the development department, et cetera. And when you apply that, 
with a permissions that then says, right, this is the level of access you've got through your permission. And then these are the users that you've got CDR access to. We also have things like employee exclusions. So if there is a particular user within the um, within the prism system that nobody should have access to, you can create this building block to say have the um, the CEO in there and apply that to everybody. So no matter who you are, you'd never be able to see the CEO's calls. And we used another example when we were talking about it. so union rep, yeah. for example, is another good example because you, you wouldn't want staff being able to see who contacted their union rep, for example. Yeah. yeah, so we could put the union reps in so that, you know, it doesn't matter who they are, you know, they may have access to the full departmental tree, but if the union reps are in, in included or in, included in the employee exclusion, they wouldn't be able to run reports on them. And then you have the network access. So this allows you to limit them down to CDR sources um, and trunks to see what they can, what data are available on those. So what you'll then have is you have your permission build and block to what they can see on the screen. The enterprise groups that then limit what CDR records they have access to. And you then have your data access, which then says, right, I've logged in to say a reporting screen. Which reports do I have access to? The reason why you'd want to limit the reports is as an admin granting access, if you give them access to the, you know, the whole um, set of reports available within PRISM, you're going to get a lot of questions back because they don't need access to, you know, 20, 30 reports. They'll be limited down to, you know, a subset of reports that are required to do their role at that point. Okay. And you do this as well for, you know, exports, dashboards. Um, the analytics is slightly different. This is where you choose when you log into analytics on the left-hand side, which view of data they have access to. So for example, your sales manager is not going to want to know about um, concurrency on trunks. So there's no point giving them access to that. And then finally, we create what's called a widget group. And a widget group allows you, you as an admin or you as a user, to create a group of widgets that you can issue to people and they can then generate um, data based upon those widgets. So you can create pre can widgets and apply them to it. And for those sat there at the moment going, wow, we are going to go into some practical examples yeah. in our demo system in a minute. Um, it's just important that you kind of understand what the availability of these things is. So once you've got those building bricks as such, what you can then do is you can then go and create many um, roles and then stack the roles on top of each other and then apply that to a user. And that will then create access to Tiger Prism. So as we do go through the session today, you will make to, or start to understand these roles and how they all fit together, how you apply them to a user and then it will show you how the security roles work for a person. Okay. Thank you, Matt. So the first question we're actually going to talk about, a slight change of tap, but does PRISM support external authentication, i.e. SSO? Um, now, just before you go to that, I will say, yes, it does. Spoiler, Matt will go into a bit more detail, but you need to be warned it can be a chargeable service when, when we add this. I think it's, it's important that people know that. But yeah, Absolutely. Matt, let's talk about SSO a little bit. Yeah, so there are three methods of access available to Tiger Prism. So when a user hits the login page, there is all, uh, obviously a local username and password. So this is a password and email address driven um, login. So it's a local thing. The passwords are stored within Prism itself. Um, and then when they log in, that's how they, they access the system. There is full SSO available through your um, SSO provider, whatever it may be. This is then passing off the authentication to a third party to authenticate and then log the user in. Now, I mean, given this is security, I think yeah. it is worth pointing out that SSO is better. Yes. Because when you disable that individual because they leave your organization, their access is removed. Right. And that's it an AD level. Correct. Local accounts, 
will always remain active until you remove them manually. And system administrators can do that, and, yeah. and you know we can help you with that. But SSO is is safer from a security point of view. Correct. And there is a there is a third authentication method, but to be um, clear on this, it's only available for installations that are on premise where we can use Windows authentication. So if your Tiger system is on premise and we are in your Active Directory, we can use Windows authentication as well. So there'll be a separate button for Windows authentication. And also just something else, you can have multiple providers, SSO providers, it doesn't have to be a single one. If your company is split into two, and you may have two separate providers, you can have multiple logons on the screen here. They can all be configured for you. Great, thank you. Right, if you want to log in, Matt, our next question is actually going to take us into a uh, into a real life example. Okay. So um, we had a question come in, said my sales manager wants to give me access to the sales team. How can I restrict what they can see and do in prison? So this is a great example from what you've talked about, about stacking Roles. Yeah. So what we're going to do then is we're going to go and look at the security model. So this part here obviously is available to admins or anybody that you've granted access to the security. And when you log into this tile here, it's broken down then by showing you how many accounts you've got and what roles, etc. you've been you've set up here and how many accounts you've got active and so on. So you can monitor at a high level what's going on with your prison system. So the first thing that we would need to do is we would need to come over here to our group section. So under our group section, these are talking about the building blocks, okay, and how we create these building blocks to create a role. So I'm going to start with the department one first here. So we're looking at our sales department. So I want to create a new role that grants CDR access to my sales department. So I can come into here, I can click on the departments, I can click the plus button here to create a new one, and I can give this a new a set. So um, sales team CDR, let's call, it, let's call it that. And you can give it a description, so later on down the line that you can, um, that you can see what that was at that point. So once I've created this, given it a description, underneath here will be your tree that, that's been created. Now, we will cover for a bit more um, about trees further on, but in here, what you do is at the end of each department, you can click on the cog and it will say, can the user see that department when they open up the tree, or when they open up a dashboard, or can they run data or run CDR data against it? So there are two different settings here. So can they view the tree or can they run data against it? So if I click allow data access, you'll see here the icon changes to a tick and the icon changes here to an eye. OK, so this means that they can view that department and they can run reports on it. I was going to say, when you say run data, you mean run reports, analytic it's, queries, those types forward. of things. Yeah, yeah. Whatever, whatever you've given them access through the role, whether it be dashboards, reports, yeah. analytics, this is saying within those modules, what data can they see? Yeah. So I'm going to go to the sales team. I'm going to say they've got CDR access. By default, when you set that, it also gives them access to view that tree. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to see it on the screen. So. You choose all the levels, you can have multiple ones in here, you could choose three, four, five, it doesn't matter how many of these you select and at which level. So I'm going to also say that's hidden as well, I'm going to put that back. So we've selected the sales team and we just simply click save. So that creates my building block to go right. I, when I apply this building block to a user, they will be able to run CDR data against that level on the tree. As people go into that level or leave that level, they will automatically gain access as they go into that department and they will lose access as they leave that department through the automation of the, the, the directory. Now, it could be as well that you want to exclude your sales manager from, from the list. So again, it's another building block. I come into the employee exclusions. 
I create myself an exclusion and I say, right, but I also want to exclude the sales manager. And what you can then do is you can come into the list here and you can then add the person that you want to exclude from the list by then clicking the plus button here and it will then exclude them from the list. So uh, right. We're gonna we're gonna talk about directories a little bit more in a minute, Matt, but is that where this is being populated from? Yeah, so this will be populated from the directories. This list will be excluded. It, the exclusion list will come from the directory as well. So once you've created the person you want to exclude, again, you then click save. You can have more than one as well. You can have multiple people. So again, if we talked about union reps, you could have five, six, So you could seven, include the whole team, team in one, yeah, in one in role. One yeah. role, yeah. yeah. So I'm going to add that in as well. So that's my exclusion here. So my next building block is we need to make a decision on are they going to have reports access, widgets access, or dashboards access. So I'm going to say my sales manager is going to have access to a few reports and we're going to have access to a couple of dashboards. I don't really want them to have access to exports, analytics, and widgets at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to go into my reports and I'm going to create a new report group. And this will then start to make sense about, again, building these blocks. So I'm going to say my sales reports, okay? In my sales reports, which reports can they run? So in here again will be the list of all the reports. And again, you can see how many reports are available in here. You don't want to be giving them reports access to all of these. But what they are interested in is say the departmental answer performance. So they're looking for their inbound stats maybe, and maybe you know departmental call summary report as well. So we'll give them access to two reports because that's really all they need at the moment. Okay, again, you can give them as many of these or as little of these as you want. You don't have to select all the reports. I think it ties back in excellently, though. You know, some of these reports are more sensitive than others. Correct. Yes. And, and you know, we, as I started at the beginning of this session talking about, this is this example of where you don't have to make them a system administrator so they can see everything. You can be very, very restrictive on what they can do. Yeah. And the great thing about these building blocks is, let's say that all of the sales team need a new report, what you can do is you can come back into these, you see, edit this and go and enable another report. And anybody that has that, that role assigned to them will then automatically get that new report rather than you having to you know, go through each individual user and update them as well. So again, creating these building blocks just allows you to have that flexibility of you know, editing one role and then it updating everybody in one go. So the last one, final one here we'll go through quickly is dashboards. And again, it works in the exact same logic as, as the, um, the reports. So what we do is we create a new dashboard access group. And we'll call this the sales dashboards. And again, we can choose from them in the list here, all, all of the dashboards we wish to give them access to. So I'm gonna say, I wanna give them the incoming performance, and then they can have the team performance one, because they're the two that I think are gonna be really interesting to my, my sales manager to, to keep an eye on what's going on. They run an inbound sales team, so obviously what they want to be doing is looking at, you know, what's what's coming in, etc., and you know, how they can better deal with that department. Who's taken how many calls? Yeah. Have you lost any calls? You know, it'll then show on his dashboard that they've lost four calls and give them yeah. a number and they can ring them back. Yeah. It, it's useful information to them. So I've now created my sort of building blocks here under my groups. So how do I create these now as roles to assign to my sales manager? So I've created my groups. What I now need to do is I need to go into my roles and I need to create new roles. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a role and call this um, reports and dashboards. Now, 
I've not used the word sales manager or anything in here because all I'm going to do, this role is just going to give access to people to see reports and dashboards, okay? And again, I promise this will make sense when we go to create the more or create a user, how um, this all fits together. So in my wizard, all I'm interested in at the moment is the permissions, okay? So in my permissions, what am I giving access to? So in my permissions, you'll see here, each one of these options is a tile on the front screen. So as I go through them here, I can say, right, I may wanna give access to charges. I can give them access to charges, but I can then start to restrict them. So the menu options that then are within charging, I can start to disable them from in here. So what you can do in here, and I'm going to set this by default. So I'm going to give them access to the cost data because that's what's important to us. And as I go through, I'm going to look through and go, what else do I want to give them access to? Um, and if there are teams, you may want to give them access to teams dashboards or Office 365 dashboards, teams reports, Office 365 reports, okay? If you're a non-teams customer, you may come down to your telephony section at the bottom and then you would choose your dashboards and your reports okay so it depends if you're a non-teams customer you would give the teams ones if you're a uh, what we call traditional telephony you would give the reports or, or both as well or both. Yeah. Are now. yeah so i'm going to grant both on that on that front here so once I've selected that here, it tells me how many permissions I've selected, which is five, and I will carry on. Right. And I think, I think, and I know you're about to go into it, but I think the important thing, if you can just scroll back up to the top, because this, I, I made the same mistake the first time I played around with a role. Yeah. You only need to add things into one of these three Correct. sections. Yep. So we're going to skip past the enterprise group and the data access group because at the moment we don't want to to, to create that. And, I'll explain why when we do it in a second. So I'm going to go on to the next screen and I'm not going to apply any of these groups here. OK, you can do. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just going to show you the, the, the sort of the best way of, of, of doing this. So I'm going to skip past that and I'm going to skip past the data access groups. And if you want to, you can review your permissions that you've created or your access groups, enterprise groups or data access groups and click submit. So I've created a role that just gives people access to reports and dashboards on the screens. So I now need to create another role. And here's I'm going to create another role and I'm going to call this sales CDR data. In my permissions, I don't need to give permissions because my other role gives them permissions. So what I'm going to be skipping over to now is my enterprise groups here. And in my enterprise groups, I'm going to select the one I created earlier, the sales team CDR access. And I'm going to click next. I'm going to skip on the data access groups, click next and click submit. So I've now got two building bricks. I've got the access to show them what they see on the screen. I've now got my CDR data, which will limit what they can do when they're in there. I just need a final building brick. So I'm going to call this um, sales reports and dashboards. So my final building brick, I'm going to skip past permissions. I'm going to skip past the enterprise groups and I'm going to go on to my data access groups. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, right, I'm going to select my sales reports because they're the ones that I want to grant access to. I can also add in the sales dashboards as well because they're linked together. You know, if I update one, I can update the other um, in here and I can click next and I can click submit on that. And that's created a third building block block for me. So I just need to create a final building block, which was the one to exclude my sales manager from, from the data. So I click the create button again. 
pull this uh, exclude sales manager. I think I think it's worth noting just where you go through and create this one, Matt. You know, obviously some of these are very specific, but yep. some of these building blocks you will use across multiple roles Correct. as you set customers up. And, and to Matt's point, yes, you could tick things in each, yep. but then you can't ever reuse that block for something else because it's very specific to the sales model. Correct. Um, and again, if we use that union rep example, you would potentially want to use that building block with every employee every Correct. time you create something. Correct. So I've now created my building blocks as such. Now I've created these, what I need to do is then apply these building blocks to an account when I create it. So when I create an account, I come up to my employees at the top here. I'm going to create an account just by clicking on the create button. I'm going to choose who I'm going to create it from. Now you can't type this in, you have to choose it from a from a drop down list. Okay. So this is again driven from your directory. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to create one for Alex here. In my account details, this is the important part here. So if you're going to create an account, if you've got an SSO account, you'll have the SSO logons here. If you're creating a local account for them, you can create here or you can disable it as well. So if you're only creating SSO accounts, you can disable the login, the local login for that person as well. And you have three available options at the top here. So can they access the API? If you're licensed for the API, you can turn this on. Can a user view digits? Now, this is a very important setting here. So what this does is within your system, you can choose how many characters within the phone number are masked. And if you mask the phone number, can the user see the full phone number or are you masking the last three or four digits of the phone number? So by default, it's three and they will have hashes at the end. So it will be the full number with the last three digits hashed out. Um, and the do not sync is for um, our Tiger um, Cube application. So if there are any changes to the account, don't synchronize with Cube. So if there's a very specific thing you're doing with them, don't synchronize it. But normally you would leave that off. Yeah. It's the view digits. Can they see them? Can they not see them? So I'm going to say you can see all the digits. So as a sales manager, I want him to be ringing back our customer, so he needs to see the number. So when I create the role, it comes then and lists out all of the roles that are available to me. So what I'm going to say is, right, I want to give them this user needs dashboard and reports access, okay? I can then go, they could have sales CDR access, or I could also use my view my directory one at this point and say, right, what this does is then automatically gives them access to CDR records in their department. So I don't have to keep creating this role every time for each individual department. And that works well for the manager because they're at the top of the food. What about somebody within the team if you tick that box? They would still get access to everyone in their team. Yeah, including their manager. Including their manager, yeah. everybody in there, unless you set the role to exclude them, okay? So that would grant access, but then you can exclude people as well. Yeah. Hence why, again, these building blocks are going right. Well, I'm gonna, rather than create 50 roles for all of my departments. I create, I use my view, my directory to give them access to everything in their tree and below yeah. in here. But again, if you're creating custom ones, because you've got to select five, six, seven departments, you know, you, you can select this. Yeah. And then you can use the sales reports and dashboards, or you can just create a generic one and call it dashboards and reports. And then every time you update those groups, it will automatically roll out to all of those people, okay? Yeah, so if a new dashboard or report came along, yep. you go in, do it in one place, every single person with Prism Access gets it. Correct. Otherwise, if you've created one where you've ticked all the boxes and so on, you're going to have to go back through every single role to add them in. So try and keep them as, you know, concise as possible so when you make changes it does it across everybody yeah so i've selected my four options here I click next 
can go through this and click submit. What this does then is it sends off an email to them and a user has to activate their account. Now, what I wanted to show you here though is how did our building blocks fit together? So in our roles, what it does is it visually shows you at the bottom then what you've given them access to. It shows you all the permissions that you've given them access to, what CDR data that you've given them access to, and again, made a custom one you can see here, who you're excluding for them, which reports you've given them access to, and which dashboards you've given them access to. And again, why it's important here is, you know, creating these as generically as possible is let's say I want to give everybody access to another dashboard, as Richard said, you can just go in and update that role and away you go. Yeah, and look, as a system administrator, if somebody comes to you and says, this isn't working, you've yeah. got a great little one place, go and view and go, no, it should be, there's something else wrong here. Correct. Um, and, and, you know, that's where our support team comes in, raise a case on the web form, get that submitted to us and, and we'd figure it out for you. But yeah, that thing. Okay. All right. Thank you, Matt. Okay. Um, just while we were doing that, I want to pop back to SSO very quickly. Sure. Um, so we had a question coming from Paul. So can the SSO be enabled, uh, enabled turned on easily retrospectively if already using local accounts? And if you turn on SSO, does it disable the local log on, login? So no. It, so in answer to the first question, yes, it's very easy to retrospectively add it. It's just the setting that we enable. It doesn't disable the local accounts. What you will need to do is go into each individual account and the slider that I showed you before and just turn it off. Yeah, or delete the accounts if you don't want them anymore. Yeah, delete the accounts if they're no longer needed. But if you want to disable the local accounts, it is just a simple slider, turn it off, and they will then fall back to using the SSO option. Look, it, it's something worth thinking about. You know, our first question came in with 27,001 in mind. Yeah. You know, if you. In, as part of your levers process within your organization, if you are using local accounts, you should add a check to say, make sure their Prism account's deleted. Obviously, yeah. if you're not using local accounts, you don't need to do that because it will be taken care of in your wider levers process. Correct. Um, and you can as well, at a whole level, disable local logins. So yeah. if you only ever want to use SSO, we can turn it off at the top level. Yeah. So when they hit the login page, this one here, it'll only show, it will only show the SSO button. Yeah. This bit here can be completely removed by just yeah. turning off local login on the right. system. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, next question. So, so we talk a little bit about directories. So the question is, I don't have an accurate directory. How can I still provide role based access? Now, look, I mean, I know this is, this isn't easy. Can we, can we, I'm just conscious of time today as well, Matt. So can yeah. we just a couple of minutes on this one? And I think if people want to discuss this more, it's worth getting in touch with us and, and we can we can spend some more time on it with them. Sure. So your directory in 99% of cases is built from a source that's provided by your company. Okay. So a prime example is your your AD that we connect to. We synchronize with this to create your departments, your users, and so on. So the first place that we would start with is, you know, talking internally in a business is where is a good place to go and feed that data into prison form. So if it's not right, that's where we would start is we would go with you to your source to go right. You know, it's not right in your source. How can you tidy that up? How can you make it better? Or is it there's something that you may need to create a supplement that you need to provide to us? It may be you know, a spreadsheet or something like that, that, you know, is more concise than your source data that we currently connect to, yeah. to create these trees for you. Yeah. And we, we definitely can, can work. And, and we can help people with what's the minimum you need to provide us as right. well. And, yeah. You know, we do link to Azure AD. If you're not doing that at the moment, we can link to your actual AD if you're on-prem, you know, there is lots of options available, I think is the point. Um, we just had another question popping. So can you set up permissions via cost center if that info is accurate. Actually, that ties in quite well with this directory structure. So. 100%. So again, it's it's in your groups. You've got your cost centers here. You create them exactly the same way as your departments, and then you can create them for, you know, because it could be that as a business, my department's called development, but you don't care about that if you were in finance. What you're interested in is 
cost center one, two, three, and four. So again, you can give them access in the department to the development side, and then in your cost center tree, you can give them access to the, the multiple uh, cost centers that are available in your tree. So yes, they are separate groups that you need to configure and then assign to a role and then assign to a user. If you are using the view my directory role, it will give them access to the department has available they have available to them yeah. or their cost center or their projects. Now, again, just just to be clear on these as well, these are generic names. They can be changed. So if some of you look at this and go, well, I don't have a department, a cost center or a projects tree. These can also be renamed by the administrator so they can be you know, made unique. Make more sense to make the organi sense to your organization. organization. Yeah. So we call them tree one, two, and three as underlying. That's what they're known as. But yeah, just to be aware, it may not be cost center, may not be projects, it may not be departments. But you know, hopefully they'll make sense to you as a business yeah. of what they actually are. All right. Okay. Um, the next question. So actually, it's sort of a, a follow on from where we showed the creation of that sales manager role. Yeah. So it's how do I grant access to specific call cues and dashboards? So I think, you know, we kind of showed where you go through and tick. Do you want to just go back into that screen? So let, let's pick a, a, a user we've already got in the system, please, Matt. And, okay, and let's so, just show what we've given them access to. So, yeah, I mean, we can just to step back a bit in your directory. You should have something along the lines like this, the Microsoft communication application instance. The roles of the tongue. Um, but it will have all of your all of your Microsoft call queues in here. Um, and then under there, you should have all of the individual call queues. If it doesn't look like this, open a ticket with us. We'll talk to you about how we can make it look like this. And again, these are just then levels that you can grant access to. So within your within your security, you just create another group, another department group um, in here, add a new item. And we can call this all Q sales. And then you just choose to grant access to that particular call queue. So under here, you just go into the call queue. You go into the support, uh, the sales call queue here. You allow access to it and click save. And as long as you've given access to the, the that dashboard, the call queue dashboard, and again, this is the thing gone up, oh, I didn't give access to it. So I can go back into my sales dashboards here and I can go, right, I need to give them access to the, the call queue ones. So I can come back into here and go, right, I need to give them access to the call queues. And again, we added a new dashboard called the call queue summary. I can now retro add that in as well by coming back into it's it. Everyone everybody who's got everybody that that's got that role yeah. and click save. I then can create another a new role over here. I can create a new one called um, so the sales call queue. In your enterprise groups now, I can come in here because I've created it. I just tick this over here to create that. And click next, next, and submit. That creates my role. And then I just go into all the users that I want to apply it to. So I can go into anybody that's um, not an admin. Obviously, they can't be an admin at that point. And I can go into the role and I can then just assign it to them and go, right, well, they need access to the sales call queue. Turn it on. Add it on. Click save. And you'll then see at the bottom here that they will then have access to that sales call queue. And, and it's instant, right? It's instant, yeah. As soon as I click say, they may need to refresh their browser yeah. to pick it up, but we could re-authenticate them in essence. Yeah, yeah, but they will get it instantly. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so again, in fact, you, you, you're in the right place already. Um, can I give a user multiple roles rather than having to create a new role each time? It's exactly as we did there. So you just create more roles with the specific parts that you're looking for. You go into the account, you choose the role tab at the top here, and you then choose the role that you've just previously created. And, and I guess a good example of someone here might be someone that works in, say, your HR department, you yeah. know, 
Um, you don't want them to be a system administrator, but you want them to be able to see every department, maybe with exclusion still, maybe, yeah. maybe they're not allowed to see the board or the CEO, um, but I guess you could literally go into that individual and just add each role for each department. Correct, yeah, and you can just add in as many roles in here as you want. And the good thing about it is you can then visually check that what you've done is correct, because at the bottom here it is telling you what that user is going to be able to do. So if you come back through it and you go, oh, I've got the department here, why have they got access to that? Ah, oh, it's because I've assigned that role over here, right, okay, I haven't quite got the role right, I can remove it and see whether that fixes it, or go, well, actually, I can use the stand role, I can use the view my directory role, because I know they're only ever going to see, you know, look at data within their own department. Okay, great, thank you. Um, right, we've got a couple more questions, so I will just make the call out. Um, Paul, I can see your question there that's come in. We'll pick that up offline with you. It's not really for this topic, but yeah, someone will give you a call afterwards to discuss that. Um, there's complications of any migrations, but yes, is the answer in short. Um, but yeah, so next question, are you able to match groups in Azure to roles in Tiger? So it's a complex scenario of how it works. So what I would ask on that front is that you contact either support or your account manager, and we will discuss with you what your requirements are. So we have done it in the past with, with customers where you create a Azure group or an AD group and assign that to them. And then that automatically then can link back to a, a, a role name in Prism and then give you um, access via those roles within um, Azure or Active Directory. But it's going to be on a case by case basis because it's quite complex on how it works and stuff. So we need to have further discussions on, on you know, what, what your requirements are on that. Because if you're only ever creating one or two roles, it may be, you know, quite a complex thing for something that could be solved in a much. I guess if you wanted 50 people using Prism, yeah. and perhaps you've got five managers in your contact center, you've got a HR department, you've got a special investigation unit, you've got, and it goes on and on, it's worth the effort? It is because then you can, you know, you can track it a little better internally from in your system as well as, you know, in Prism as well. But, you know, again, it's going to be on a case by case basis that, you know, we open up that communication with you, work out your requirements and then, you know, decide which is the best route to go. Maybe it is going down these these groups. Maybe it's creating them in Tiger. Maybe it's, you know, we, we use this whole view my um, directory part to create what you need. So we can just create this standard role and the view my directory and we can use cube to then automatically create accounts and stuff for you so again i would like to take those ones offline with each individual customer and discuss the requirements okay thank you um and the last pre-asked question that yeah. we've, we've got um am i missing the trick what's the best way to create a user so i guess matt this can be the quick Right, I'm just going to go bang, 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 bang. Quick summary of kind of what we've shown today. And then if anything else comes into the chat, and Rob, I can see your question now. We'll pick that up in a moment. Um, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've covered quite extensively about these groups and the roles. We create these groups and the roles. We go into the employees. So one thing I will say is that what you have is you have an employee and a guest account. So an employee is for someone internally that you want to give access to your PRISM system. But you may want to grant access to your guests. So the way you create guest accounts, these are non-staff members. On the front screen, what you would do is where you've got employees, these are your internal staff members, you'll need to manually create a contact. So you go into the contacts, you create a contact within here, and this will be your external contact. Then you'll be able to create what's known as a, a guest account. So within here, you can create then a guest account for your for your non your third party yeah. members here. And this would work the same as a local account. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, turned off, it's account. always available yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's a local account that you would create. And when you create it, it will then um, go through the same system as everything else. But 
that's for your non-employees as well as for your employees. And one thing to be clear about as well, when you create an account, it will automatically send an email to them. So when you create an account, an email will arrive to the email address that's assigned to the account, or obviously with the contact, you need to make sure there's an email address. But that's mandatory though, right? You need a, you need it's basically a first address. name and an email address. Yeah. That's, that's all we ask for, really, isn't yeah. it? So when the email goes to them, they'll click on the link. If it's SSO, it won't ask them to enter a password because obviously it's authenticated elsewhere. If it's a local account, it will ask the user to enter a password. The password settings are all under your settings here when you can put your password policy in place, whatever it may be. It may be you can set it to expire every 90 days, so that's an ISO requirement. You set it in here how many time, how many days until it expires. Um, you can set your complexity, you can put other requirements um, and so on. There is also the option as well, if you've got as part of your policy to prevent reuse of passwords, you can also set that as well within Prism to go right. They can't change it to password one, change it back to password, then change it back to password one, right? Okay. We're trying to- Who would do that? that? Yeah. Who would do that? And it also then gives you the list of the most used like passwords and stuff like that. And you can put prevented ones in here. So again, the password policy side of things is um, quite important, you know, for businesses nowadays to meet requirements. And this screen just allows you to, to apply that in here as well. Okay. So, and, and Matt, one question, you mentioned we send emails. Yeah. Can we modify those yeah. emails? Can so I also with, the settings and the email templates, you've got the templates that are available to you. So when on an account activation, you can come into here, you can click the edit button and it comes up with a designer. So you can put things like, you know, you can change the logo, you can add some extra text in here. You can put the IT department's, you know, extension number or email address to say, look, if yeah. you have any problems, give us, a, give us an email. Yeah, no, I think that's a good shout because whilst we obviously have our web form and that's how customers raise case with us. A lot of our customers are through partners mm -hmm. and it might be that, that actually you should be calling their service desk. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. That may be what they dictate. Of course, we're, we're always happy to hear direct, but yeah. I know some of our partners want, want their customers talking to them first. So yeah, this just allows you to then put some custom information on the, for your customers, your staff members, etc., to make it a bit more, you know, custom to delivering the service back to them. Yeah, great, thank you. Right, that's the end of the questions that came in for the webinar. Just a couple of other things to pick up that have come in while we've, while we've been going through there. Sure. So Rob asked, will there be a webinar on how multiple data sources can be imported, e.g. local switchboard directory, yeah, phone users, airtime, lots of other things we can do as well there, Rob. Um, when this session ends, you will get a link to a survey. Uh, I'm getting ahead now because I normally say this at the end. You will get a link to a survey. One of the boxes on there is please tell us what you'd like to see in the next Ask the Expert session. So Rob, if you want to put that in there, um, obviously we do read every response. We are looking for our topic for the next session, which will be next year now, probably February yeah. time. Don't hold me to that, but that, that's generally our timetable. So um, yeah, pop it in there. And if, if anyone else who's heard that, that interests you, put it in there as a suggestion as well. The more people that ask for it, the more likely we are to do it. Um, yeah, uh, so we've got a question from Adam who's asked, um, what is the integrated Windows authentication? Matt, just before you pick the answer up to that, yeah, Adam, I can see that you've asked because it's not in the guide. Is it the latest guide? No, we are updating our user guide at the moment. We expect to be issuing that in the coming months. Um, but Matt, in answer to that question, do you want to just talk a little bit about Windows the integrated Windows authentication? Yeah, so please? obviously, if the Tiger Prism system is on premise, our server is on um, your domain. Underneath the settings, you just enable the Windows authentication over here. So when you enable it, what it will do is it enables an extra box on your on your account. So if I go into an employee now over here, go into an employee and go to the login screen, what you now get is a extra box that says Windows. And this then allows you then to enter the Windows username. Now, there are two ways you can do this. 
you either put the domain backslash the username, okay, or you would put the username at the domain, etc. Yeah. It just depends on how how you configured your your network. Ninety nine percent of the time, it's just it's just for you. And so so this is applicable to where you are hosting the service yourself in your data center, and it may not work if you're hosting it off-site with a third party. Correct. Um, obviously, if we're hosting it for you, that's where SSO comes in. You can't yeah. use the integrated Windows authentication. Um, okay. Right, that's all the questions we've had through from the chat um, and our, and our pre-asked questions. So thank you very much to everyone for attending today and being with us. Um, as I said, you will get a link. Please do give us feedback. We listen to the feedback. We want to know what you want to hear from us next. Um, the recording for this will be published in about a week's time. Uh, you will get the email. So if you want to come back and check anything, please do. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.